Um, we're going to read, I'm going to read from verse 18. So if you follow it along, then you'll get an idea of what I'm going to be talking about. Great. Ephesians chapter 2. For through Jesus, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, or his family. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Let's pray. Father God, would you please help us to, have, uh, to understand a little bit about what um, you want to teach us from this passage today. And we pray that we might know your Holy Spirit living within us, teaching us, encouraging us, urging us on with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So a long time ago, back in 2009, a guy called um, James May, who is a Top Gear, was a Top Gear presenter. Do we know? Oh, I know little ones won't know who I mean, but James May and about a thousand volunteers built this. Built this. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> is it working? I love a climax, don't you? <laughs> anyway, I'm going to go on, it'll appear. So they built the world's full-sized Lego house, including a working toilet, still not there, a hot shower, and a very uncomfortable bed. And he used three point, when it comes, could you just put your thumbs up so I can say, um, he used about 3.3 million plastic bricks and it was two stories high and it's a big kind of box thing that will come up there. Sadly, James May seemed disappointed by this when I read about it. No one wanted to live in it or buy it. So in the end, they took chainsaws to it in order to destroy it, which seemed really disappointing, frankly. So I want you to think about your house and think about who you live with. Think about who you live with. Some of us live with lots of people. Some of us might live by ourselves. Some of us have mums and dads we live with or people who are looking after us. And other of us may just live with one other person. But the amazing thing that we're going to think about today is that God has always lived with his people. God has always lived with his people. Before Jesus, God lived thousands of years ago in a big tent. You can read about that in the Old Testament called a tabernacle. And the people of God used to take this tent with them as they traveled around the desert. It was big. It's not like a little tent. It was big. Later, when God's people lived in one place, they built a huge, beautiful building for God to live in. And it was enormous, and it was built with massive stones and decorated. Way! Look at you. Now you're really behind, though. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's the big Lego house. But now we're talking about something else. <laughs> so God lived in a place with, which was huge and beautiful, and it had big stones, and it was, it was covered in gold and jewels, and it was called the temple. And at the heart of the temple was a place called the holy place where God lived. And there was a massive curtain that separated God from the people so no one could get really close to God because he was so holy and powerful. But the people would come far and wide to worship God in this place. Now things then changed years later when Jesus came to earth. He was God's son. And instead of God living in a building, God lived in Jesus. He was God. So what happened when Jesus went back to be with his father after his death and resurrection? Where was God going to live then? Well, things changed. And God came, and we'll think about this very soon, at Pentecost in the form of his spirit. And he came not to live in buildings anymore, but in every person who followed him. He came to live in individual Christians. And the Christians all came together, united by their love of Jesus and with the Holy Spirit living within them, and they became God's church. And the temple, a little later, was destroyed, and actually, 
It's not needed anymore because God doesn't live in a building. He now lives in people. And even when they couldn't live close together, and even when the Christians were scattered across the world, God was with and is with each one. So Jo's helped us to think, hasn't she, that the church is a wonderful, diverse, beautiful family. You're all lovely and beautiful and individual and loved by God and cherished by him. And when you're a Christian, God comes to live within you. But Paul wanted the Ephesians to understand that God intended the church to be for everyone who trusted Christ, whoever they were and wherever they were. And he describes the church again and again as being united as one, as a body in the passage and as one humanity, all those humans gathered together where God lived. So it's not just here in Bath, it's not just St. Swithin's, but across the whole world. Any ideas how many Christians you might think there are, ish, according to the internet, across the whole world? What do you think? Let's have some ideas. How many Christians do you think across the whole world, roughly? Take a guess. Emmanuel, how many do you think? A hundred thousand. That's a lot of people need to go a little bit higher. Grown-ups, you can contribute to this if you wish to give an accurate guesstimate. Any thoughts? One and a half billion? Who said two billion? Higher? No, less than that. So about 2.5 billion Christians-ish. Um, that's a whopping church family, isn't it? That's a whopping family. And in the passage we're looking at today, Paul's helping the, the Christians in Ephesus to understand what it means for them to have God living within them. And he's using the image of a building with all the history about that tabernacle tent and the temple to help. And he suggests there's three important things needed to be a really strong church for God. So we're going to use a bit of Lego just to help. So if you're going to, do we like Lego? We, I like yeah, Lego and I'm old. So Lego, if you're going to build a Lego building, you need something really sturdy. Do you know I had a massive one of these? Could I find it this morning? No. So we're using a little one. But you need to get your foundation, don't you? If you're going to build a Lego, whatever it is, house, boat, dog, cat, person, whatever it is, you need your foundation. And I'm sure that James May, with his structure, if he didn't have his foundation, it would just not have last. And usually, you have one of these flat things, and then you start to build your walls to make them really, really sturdy. And perhaps you use some of these really extra long pieces to make them extra sturdy, and then you use loads of these little pieces, don't you, to build the building. Paul says the church needs three things, strong foundations, Jesus as its cornerstone, and important building blocks. When those things are in place, then the whole building will rise to become a holy temple where God will live by his spirit, and God will make his home. So firstly, we need those strong foundations. Let's go back to the foundations. That's fab. Well done. The, and, the, and this passage tells us we need the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. And Paul means that the church needs to build on what those early followers of Jesus saw and experienced and were taught. They knew Jesus. They saw him live and die and rise again. So we need to pay attention to what the apostles and the prophets have to say about Jesus. We copy how they lived and what they taught and what they shared with others about who he was. And as they obeyed living for Christ and obeying him and living well together and loving one another and looking after one another, then so do we. And at Pentecost, God's Spirit came and filled them and equipped them and sent them out to speak with authority to all the people they met about Jesus, to invite them to come and know him for us themselves. Good foundations were laid by those people, and we need to do the same. Secondly, we need, most important, for Jesus to be our cornerstone. Now, this is a bit more tricky, but the biggest stone of all in the building is the cornerstone. We've got a picture of it, great. Everything the early followers of um, Jesus did was as a consequence of what Jesus had done for them. He was the most important stone in the whole building. 
And when that massive temple that I was talking about was built in Jerusalem about 500 years before Jesus, these enormous stones were used to make it really sturdy. And the cornerstone was the largest one of all. And this is a picture of the, um, what it remains of the temple in Jerusalem. And the cornerstones were massive. How they did that without diggers, I don't know, and cranes. And once in place, the rest of the building around it would be constructed. But if you took the cornerstone out, then the building would just collapse. And Paul is saying that without Jesus as a cornerstone, there is no church. It will just collapse because it will not have a strong enough foundation to build on. Downstairs in Ignite last week, we took part in a spaghetti marshmallow challenge. Don't know if you've ever done that. We, just, we were trying to work out who could bring the strongest and the highest tower only using those two things, marshmallows and spaghetti. I challenge you to do that at home if you feel like a little challenge. But it became pretty clear very quickly that unless the foundations were good, there was not a lot of height and not a lot of strength. Um, and plus, it was very e easy to be tempted just to eat the marshmallows. And the spaghetti just kept snapping too. So it didn't last a hugely long time, but the towers need strong foundations if they're going to flourish. And God's church needs those foundations to be built on Jesus if it's going to flourish. Not cool music, not a lovely building, not a great cafe with lovely treats, not people that are just nice to each other, not even um, great kids groups downstairs, only a foundation of Jesus will uh, church really thrive. So lastly, the church needs building blocks. Ta -da! That's where you and I come in. Each of us is a precious, valuable, beautiful building block in the building that is this holy temple that Paul describes. And each of us as members of God's family need to stand firm on that foundation and build on what has gone before. Trust God's promises, obey his word, live out his call in life. Remember what John talked about by living out the fruit of the spirit um, uh, that we talked about last week. And in this way, this beautiful temple where God lives will be made. And this temple is where God makes his home. So when Paul describes God's people, the church, and us as his holy temple, he's making one wonderful, important point. God does not live in buildings. God lives in people. In people. Building do, buildings do not play a central part to our worship, as lovely as beautiful ones like this are. God lives in the hearts of people all over the world. Wherever a Christian lives, God lives too. He's made his home in my life. He's made his home in your life. We are a worldwide beautiful temple for him. I really struggle in my walk with Jesus when I'm not plugged into a church family. It's very easy to drift and to let other things become more important than my time with Jesus. And during the pandemic, I know how hard it was for many of us because we couldn't gather at, in person and enjoy fellowship together. Now, there's nothing in scripture that suggests that you can thrive as a Christian by yourself. Nothing. Nothing in, in scripture says that you will survive, that you will be the best you can be, that you will live that beautiful life for him as well um, on your own. But together, we will thrive. God made us for relationship with him and with one another. We're united in him. We're filled with his spirit and we have a purpose together to bring him glory. So as I finish, I want to ask you a question. What type of spirit-filled church family do you think we are at St. Swithin's? And what would you like us to be? You see, Paul gives loads of instructions in all his letters about that. He says that church needs to be, we need to be united. We need to build one another up and encourage each other with our words. We need to love one another. We need to look out for one another. We need to demonstrate kindness and compassion. We need to live peacefully together and see the good in those around us. And that's only a few it's the presence of God living with us by his spirit that helps us to live like this. It is the spirit that gives us a love for his word, for worship, for the world, for justice. And it's the spirit that produces fruit that we might be a church that reflects the character 
of Jesus. So how do you think you're doing? How, do, how are we doing? Do we care for one another? Are we giving practical help to those in need? Are we encouraging the character of Jesus to shine in one another? Do we listen well? Do we talk Jesus together? Do we pray for one another? Do we use our words to build one another up? Perhaps even when we're feeling a bit put out or neglected. Do we have a heart for unity amongst us, even with all our differences? Do we celebrate the things that are not necessarily our thing? 